Welcome back to Scotland's first AI summit here at Edinburgh Fair. Uh, I hope you all had a nice time upstairs, got to meet some new people, maybe some new robots. Um, was the new real demo on here? Did you check that out? Great stuff. I hope I did. Anyway, um, let us know how it's going online, please. Uh, at Scott AI Strategy, please use hashtag Scott AI Summit. And let's dive in on our first panel of this afternoon. These lovely people here. Called Why is Explainable AI Still a Challenge? Which sounds rather philosophical to me. Um, for this, please don't be shy. Please ask questions via the online platform. Which I as it is at uh, Scott AI Summit dash online.com Scottish AI Summit hyphen online.com That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> that one. Excellent. Oh, uh, now it's my pleasure to hand over to the session's chair, Professor Shannon Ballard, Bailey Gifford Chair in the Ethics of Data and Artificial Intelligence at the University of Edinburgh. Professor Ballard, over to you. Thanks very much, Nick, uh, and uh, thanks to everyone here. Uh, I'm really excited to be able to uh, introduce our panelists and host uh, what I know is going to be a fascinating discussion uh, about the challenge of explainable AI, uh, which, as we know, is uh, one of the important tools in the toolkit of responsible and ethical AI more broadly. Uh, so today we'll talk about uh, what that tool is, why we need it, when we need it, for whom we need it, uh, and what are the challenges uh, in developing it and using it uh, in a responsible and effective way? So uh, just for those of you in the, in the audience who may uh, be curious about why explainable AI is a tool that we need, our panelists will say much more about this. Uh, but of course, explainable AI uh, is a way of addressing what is often described as the uh, opacity of some machine learning models. The fact that they're opaque in the sense that we may not always be able to know why a particular prediction or output or result was reached. And so the idea is we want the models to be able to provide us with an explanation for what it is that they uh, have done uh, or output as a recommendation or prediction. So uh, our panelists here uh, have a very broad range of expertise on this challenge, uh, and I'm looking forward to hearing from them, so let's get right to it. I'm going to uh, introduce them, uh, starting from uh, the left hand of the stage here, uh, with Dr. Shane Burns, who is the lead data scientist at Linus Health and works closely with NHS collaborators to develop services and AI solutions to aid in patient care. Recent work has been in improving outcomes for patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and a recent NHS X Phase 3 award to operationalize AI models as part of routine patient care. Our next panelist is Dr. Dimitra Gatsia. Uh, she is an associate professor at the School of Computing at Edinburgh Napier University. Sorry, I went out of order. Uh, and a SIXA AI theme co-lead. Dimitra is interested in making computers and robots interact in a human-like way using natural language, while at the same time respecting the privacy of the users. Her current work on human-robot interaction focuses on enhancing computers and robots' conversational capabilities with something like common sense, similar to the ones present in human-to-human -human communication. Our next panelist to the right of Dimitra is Dr. Georgios Leontidis, is the University of Aberdeen's Interdisciplinary Director of Data and AI and a reader in machine learning. He has been conducting world-leading activity on foundational elements of machine learning for more than a decade, being active in the international community both as an author and a senior program committee for flagship AI venues. And then finally, uh, we have Brian Mullins, a CEO of Mind Foundry, an Oxford University company that we are uh, happy to say was recently awarded COGX's award for best innovation in explainable AI. Brian is an entrepreneur and technical leader with over a decade of experience in high growth technology companies. 
As CEO, he leads a team of some of the UK's top scientists and engineers to solve problems with AI built for high-stakes applications across insurance, government, security, and defense. Thank you all for being with us today. And uh, let's get started uh, by helping to shape uh, uh, and fill out the, the topic uh, that is our, uh, our, our frame today. So I'm going to start uh, perhaps with illuminating some of the technical uh, perspectives around this challenge. Um, and I'll begin, uh, Dimitri, with you. So uh, can you tell us, are all AI models and algorithms black boxes or unexplainable uh, in this sense? And in, in explaining this to us, uh, if you could uh, help the audience also understand the difference between models that are described as explainable and those that are described as interpretable. Yep. Uh, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, so there is a big discussion about explainability and black box models, of course. Um, but what people tend to forget is that when AI started, there were simpler models, there were expert rule-based systems that are all fully explainable. What we mean by that is the developer can actually understand how the system makes decisions, uh, how it learns from the data, if data is used, um, and what the end user might see in every scenario. Uh, of course, if we were still using these approaches, we wouldn't be here today in such a big venue talking about AI. Uh, there has been um, a lot of uh, new advances in this area, especially with deep learning that most of people are aware of and most people want to use. Uh, the, all the bad publicity, though, also comes from deep learning because we can't explain it. Um, we can't understand how uh, the model, uh, what the model learns from the data uh, because it uses highly complex maths into different layers and different transformations and thousands of data. So all of these uh, add to the complexity. Uh, so there are now two ways to try to explain uh, these type of models. So we have the simpler models that I mentioned uh, in the beginning that are fully interpretable, like we know exactly how each data point is going to affect the decision that has been made. Uh, and then we have these black boxes that in order to explain them, we either try to approximate, well, we kind of use another deep learning model to try and approximate how they make decisions in order to understand how they work. Of course, that's questionable by itself, but uh, this is one of the ways that people try to do that. Um, other approaches people have used, like visualization, trying to see what happens at every stage of these uh, models, like the different layers, etc. Uh, of course, all of these comes, come with problems. And of course, because we are not able to uh, understand how they work, it's super hard to actually implement them in real world scenarios, with, in real complex uh, data uh, tasks. Uh, but I think the question was more about whether are they all of them, all AI black box. And the reality is that it's not. And there are other simpler approaches that we can use in simpler, uh, to, to solve simpler, simpler problems. And everyone has come across this uh, when interacting with technology, with your phones, etc. We don't understand it all the times so that there might be some AI going on behind that. Um, but yeah, I think um, we should be more careful when we apply what, and we should be more open-minded that we don't have to use the new shiny thing to solve everything, and we can just resort to older approaches as well in some cases. So, thanks. Thanks, Demetra. Uh, actually, that leads us uh, directly into the next question, which uh, I'm going to uh, pose uh, to you, uh, Georgia. So uh, are there areas where uh, non-explainable models uh, can uh, responsibly uh, and safely be used. Uh, and if you could touch on uh, the difference between using uh, these kinds of opaque uh, uh, deep learning models in high stakes versus low stakes contexts. Thanks, Anna. Yeah, that's a very nice question. So actually, I think everybody agrees that explainability is a very important element to any AI system. But I think from my perspective, one size fits all it doesn't really work in that context. So I think we have to contextualize uh, the purpose of an AI system, why we want to use it, what is the outcome of that, what is the perhaps implication of this AI system, and then see how extendability can 
can be part of this pipeline. So for instance, you might say that you have a, a situation where performance is, is the main objective and then you might prioritize performance over extendability or perhaps user interface and, and how the users are part of the whole pipeline, both on the development side or the end user side and so on. So I think when we speak about the extendability um, in high versus low stake situations, we also have to um, add the component of high and low uh, use within different sectors. So for instance, you might say that a high stake sector is healthcare where um, an AI system you wouldn't like to make um, a decision on its own. So you would like to be part of a human AI interaction loop where it's an assistive tool to the, to the clinician to make a decision. Uh, but also within this high stake sector, you might have low and high um, use importance. For instance, you might say that an AI system that's making decisions on its own within healthcare, it's a very high risk use of AI system because no one is supervising the AI system. But if you have an AI system that is, is working alongside the clinician and, and the, the final decision is made by the clinician, you might say that extendability in this case is, is, is of lower importance because it's an assistive tool to the clinician. Um, but then if we move to other sectors, for instance, energy, you might have the situation where you have an AI system trying to detect very rare events that happen in nuclear reactors. And in this case, you might say, can I prevent a nuclear disaster because an AI system might be pointing out to an event that happens in the nuclear reactor? Perhaps this AI system cannot explain why it points to a specific perturbation in the reactor that says this is, might lead to a disaster, but the nuclear physicists have to make a decision at this point. And maybe the only tool that they have at their disposal to make a quick decision is the AI system. So I posed the question, would explainability in this case be a reason not to trust the AI tool or not? So I guess, I guess from my, my perspective is that explainability has to be considered in tandem with other elements of performance, user interface, and so on. Now, if we move from a more high stake sectors to a perhaps lower stake sectors, say games industry, where you might have AI developing games, I guess someone can argue that even in this scenario, there might be cases where AI can cause harm because the users are playing games and maybe how the AI behaves in the game might be affecting how teenagers uh, you know, might, might behave in the, in the outside world. So people can put different connotations in that context. But overall, you can say that it's a lower stake industry. In the same case, can be uh, built uh, about Amazon or Netflix. I guess if Amazon recommends me a jumper versus a cert, I don't think it's a disaster for me, so I don't need really to be explained how uh, Amazon came about with this um, decision or recommendation. The same thing with Netflix. If they suggest you a different series that you don't like, perhaps it's not a disaster. You can just pass and go to the next one. Um, so again, from my perspective, I don't want to, uh, to go to the technical side at, at the moment. I just want to, to finish with, with saying that although extendability should be something that we consider at the very fundamental level, like extendability by design in every single approach, I think it's important to understand that from a technical perspective, if uh, academics or researchers like myself uh, would have a choice, we will always be saying that every single deep learning model that we're developing will be explainable by design. But there are open challenges, uh, technical challenges that we need to overcome. And then we are always faced with a dilemma do I need performance? Do I need, do I need user interface? Do I need user experience or extendability? And sometimes the decision is not clear where you draw a line among all of these different areas. That's yeah. great. Thank you uh, for that. So, so yeah, so I think it's clear that we have technical challenges, but we also have these uh, more contextual challenges about what the use case is, who the audience is, why they need an explanation, what kind of explanation they need. The nuclear safety engineer may need an explanation just as much as the cancer patient, but why they need it and, and what kind of explanation they need will, will likely be very different. Um, that's, uh, I think, a good kind of orientation to some of the technical challenges that, uh, that we have to uh, confront here. Um, I'm going to, in a moment, um, ask uh, uh, our other panelists to talk a little bit about some kind of concrete uh, uh, use cases in high stakes scenarios uh, that they have experience with. Um, but before I do that, just a reminder to the audience, uh, both here and online, to uh, add your questions, which hopefully are now already starting to bubble up uh, into the uh, 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 conference tool so that uh, we can get to those questions uh, when, our, when our panelists have uh, concluded their opening uh, remarks. So I'm going to go next uh, to you, Brian, um, 
and, and talk a little bit, uh, if you will, about uh, Mind Foundry's work in this area. So Mind Foundry has worked with the Scottish government on developing uh, ethical and explainable AI in the public sector, and starting with Police Scotland as a use case. How did Mind Foundry approach this? I, I think it's an important to point out uh, what was said about how some applications of AI are not high stakes and, and others are. Uh, that we probably need a shared understanding of what the high stakes is a, a definition. Certainly from Mind Foundry's point of view, it's uh, applications one, that one, 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 the decisions affect the lives of individuals or are made at the scale of a population. Um, and I can't think of an application that gets much more high stakes than that of law enforcement. And um, I, think, I think in that particular case, it was very important to us uh, simultaneously the work that was going on uh, in Scotland with the Scottish AI strategy and, and really laying the groundwork for how we could approach those applications um, in, in ways that, that current state-of-the-art off-the-shelf technologies were not addressing. Um, and, and I think there's one more ask, aspect in particular that we see very commonly amongst high-stakes customers um, where they think the considerations that they'll apply to things like safety and, 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 and the requir requirements of the systems could be addressed with simple fixes like human in the loop. And, and it's very important to dispel this notion. Um, it, it's, it's a bit irresponsible to think of um, a situation where we all know that these systems will outpace the individuals. They'll be looked upon as a point of friction. Um, and we see time and time again, and this, this was not the case in, in Police Scotland, but but going into it, we're always weary because we see people time and time again looking at that human in the loop as a safety net um, where, where ultimately though the system gets deployed, people get a little bit of comfort and the exception that that person is there to handle has not occurred yet. And yet now they look like a target for automation and they are, they are summarily removed and automated away and all the consideration goes along with them. Um, the systems must be designed where some of the agency of the system understands the complexity of the application specifically. What does the data represent? What do the methods that are being used actually mean in the context of the data? And is it appropriate for those methods to be paired with the intervention that is being considered and the direction of that intervention? And, and more specifically, I think we see examples where data about a population is used to make specific decisions about policy day to day. Um, in, in other parts of the world, this has led to uh, the cases of over-policing in minority neighborhoods. Some, some existing biases, you know, even, even if they were unconscious, they've been collected in years worth of data and, and it results in patterns being reinforced in these automated systems. When we began to work with the Scottish government and Police Scotland, it was, it was fantastic to see that they didn't want that to happen. They, they needed to understand that, that the way the technology was using uh, could be explained to the stakeholders. Most importantly, the people whose lives were, were affected by it. Um, but, but all of the stakeholders, and I think a lot of the way that it's approached today, um, that, that consideration is, is only for a, a thin layer of explainability um, if, if it even extends beyond the data scientist who's looking at the system, it maybe gets to the point where some feature influences can be explained to users of the system. And that's not whose life is affected. Going the extra distance to explain it to, to the person who's affected by that decision is absolutely critical. And, and in that, you need methods to be used with data that represents things about that individual. Uh, it needs to be paired in a way that you can explain you can, you can detect bias, and you can keep it from propagating throughout the system. You can't remove it, right? That, that's, that's a myth you'll chase, you know, and, 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 and never actually be able to accomplish. But if you understand that the best that you can do is detect it and keep it from propagating through the system, whether that's uh, in, online with operational tools or during the architectural process, then, then you can understand how it fits in the way that an organization acts. And, and I'd say, I'd go one step further and say, in these high stakes applications, um, frequently, and this was in the case of Police Scotland, many of the applications at first glance appear to be more simple applications of machine learning. 
and, and in many settings, many corporate settings, they would be approached as such, and perhaps appropriately so. Um, automation tasks, reading of forms, um, things that, that you think there is an off-the-shelf solution for, and there are plenty of easy-to-use tools. Um, but because of the black box problem, because you don't understand more than the influence of certain inputs, you, do, you don't have a deterministic view of how it's making a decision, you, you may not capture and understand the bias until it's too late. Um, and, and that's why it was so critical. I mean, otherwise, you could imagine that you know, if you're misidentified, you know, automating paperwork as a suspect instead of a victim, your journey is going to be very different when you're dealing with a police force and, and, and dealing with, with the law. Great. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go on next to you, Shane, um, and, and ask uh, again how you uh, have uh, worked with uh, this challenge in the context of healthcare, which is another high stakes uh, use case uh, for explainability. Um, so what are the challenges and consequences of unexplainable AI in clinical settings uh, that you've grappled with? Yeah, so apologies if I touch on some of the earlier points, but uh, some great points were mentioned. So it might make sense to follow on from this idea of interpretability versus explainability. So when we talk about a healthcare setting, uh, arguably that is one of the highest stake settings that there is. And then there therefore is this kind of need or want to use something that is very transparent or something that's inheritably interpretable. Um, I still think what the priority needs to be here is using a model framework or whatever tools and frameworks to make the model decisions as explainable as possible. Um, as we often see across lots of areas of AI machine learning, um, interpretability doesn't always mean explainability and they're often confused and mixed up. Uh, just to, I guess, give a, a basic example on this, um, if we were to take risk prediction models for patient care, uh, typically you might build that using a patient's electronic health record history. You could have things around uh, labs data, prescribing data, hospital admission history, comorbidities, and more. So typically you, you might end up with a feature set on the order of hundreds, and some of those features are quite complex. So even if you do have an interpretable method, which you can follow from start to end, it's, I think, a big stretch to say that that's explainable by the time you go through that process. Um, other common issues which arise, and again, they're not unique to healthcare, would be things like data drift, um, biases in data, confounding bias. A very kind of interesting uh, case study, which a lot of people may have heard of, um, was a study in which the researchers were looking to predict survival chances in pneumonia patients. And one of the kind of key findings that come out of this work was that uh, one of the biggest predictors for survival was having asthma. So when you sit back and think about that objectively, what that model is telling you is that if you present with pneumonia and you have asthma, you're in a good position. So if you, if you were to blindly use that, you see that there has to be some kind of problem there. So what the researchers did to interrogate the model and interrogate the model explainability is they used an interpretable framework and they then found that patients who presented in this hospital with asthma and pneumonia got a different treatment pathway. So they were, they were admitted directly to ICU versus non-asthma patients. And as a result, they got better quality of care, or not better quality, a more intensive care, and had better survival chances. So this kind of really highlights the, I guess, the danger of unexplainable AI and the importance of explainable AI. Were you to kind of blindly deploy this into a different hospital system which didn't have that kind of care pathway, you can imagine what the consequences could be. Other kind of examples which I guess are a bit closer to home, um, thinking more along the lines of NHS data, is around uh, missing data. So missing data, which is, I guess, one of the fundamentals when you're starting off in your any, any data-related career, is common to, to all problems. Um, in a healthcare setting, data is often missing for a reason. So just to give some examples on this, um, in one healthcare setting or one health board, it could be very commonplace if you have diabetes or heart failure to get regular BMI measurements. In a different health board, it could be commonplace if you're over the age of 50 to have regular BMI measurements. If you then go to build a health prediction model for something that might not necessarily be related to any of those conditions, and you use that data, so let's say you, you might use something that's sparsity aware, handles missing data, you might do some kind of infill technique in the data. There is a massive danger, and, and we've kind of seen this in practice, that what the model does, it will learn the context behind having data or the context behind not having missing data. 
as not related to what you're trying to predict on, but related to, in the first instance, having diabetes or having heart failure, or the second instance, being over a certain age. So straight away, this kind of confounding bias has crept in that you haven't seen and you need to be able to identify. And it kind of really like emphasizes the need for explainable AI in that setting. Um, I, I know uh, Brian mentioned the human in the loop factor. That is something that's been kind of quite important in our own work. Um, so at Lena's Health, we're very lucky. We collaborate closely with the NHS. Um, and this has been kind of so key in driving this work forward. Um, as you mentioned earlier, we're at the point of um, putting AI as part of routine uh, patient care. But what goes along with this is surface and explainability. So it's important to give as much explainability as possible. So this starts from fairness metrics to global explainability for your overall model, what's important to that model, to then local explainability. So what's driving individual predictions for individual patients? This feedback then from the clinicians tells us uh, where we're doing well, where we're doing poorly, where things don't make sense, and allow us to kind of evolve our techniques. Um, just to make one kind of uh, final closing point on this as well, um, you know, what I think is kind of so crucial here is the, as we've heard mentioned a lot say the public trust and acceptance of AI systems. Um, when we think of the, the AI, I guess, ethical assessment, uh, governance, accreditation landscape, that's still at, you know, relatively early days. Um, but what I feel is going to be absolutely key is having explainability at the core of that. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much. Um, the questions are coming in uh, fast and hot, and we have uh, lots of really good ones here. So uh, hopefully we'll have time to get through most of them. Um, the first question I'm going to pose, and I may direct a question to one of you, but feel free if others really want to jump in afterwards and, and add to uh, a response, please uh, don't hesitate to do that. Um, but I'm going to direct the first question to you, Dimitra, because uh, you have done work on kind of comparing the ways um, that uh, humans might communicate reasons and the ways that uh, machines might do that. Um, so uh, the, one of the questions um, here is, is it, is it correct to say that human intelligence is explainable? Oh, um, I don't think we can explain human intelligence either. Like, uh, we often are in situations where people do something and you don't understand why they did uh, something. Of course, I haven't done research on the topic, to, so that's my personal impression rather than my expert um, knowledge. Uh, I think it's really hard to... So what AI essentially in their origins like try to do is to simulate human intelligence. And I think it's a very valid point that if we can't understand exactly how people think, how, much, how can we make a machine think the same way, uh, that's a really uh, big issue. Uh, and I think there are people working in neuroscience that they, they try to actually figure out how our brains make decisions, how they perceive the world and how they combine all this information. Uh, but yeah, I think there's still a, lot, a long way to go to solve that. Maybe a related follow-up question to that. Um, humans, when we explain our own actions, don't always tell the truth or sometimes we don't understand our own reasons and so we might make something up that sounds like it's plausible but we may not be sure ourselves whether this is in fact why we came to this decision. Um, so maybe uh, any of you have any thoughts on how when we have an explainable model or uh, an explanation that's generated, how do we know if it's a good explanation or an accurate explanation or that we should trust the explanation? I can, I can yeah, please, Georges. I, I don't know the first punch. Um, I think that's a very valid point, uh, but before I address that, I, I want to go back to, to the question that, that you posed to, to Dimitri to just add, add one element there that um, sometimes we are putting AI at, at a higher standard than a human explanation. Sometimes we, we have more demands and, and more, you know, we ask more from an AI system than perhaps what we ask from, an, uh, from a human. And that, re that regards to also the, the situation where you might have multiple people in, in a setting that disagree with each other. So you, po you have multiple experts, you pose the same question, you pose the same information, and they cannot conclude to the same outcome. But then when it comes to AI systems, I think we are very quick to point a finger and say the AI system failed in this case, well, so we don't trust it no matter what. So I, I think we have to perhaps um, find the, the proper balance between how much we trust the system and how much we don't trust the system, but contextualized with respect to even how we humans among ourselves agree or disagree in, in a certain context. 
so going back to what you asked specifically about trust and, and, and explanation and everything, um, I think depending on what type of AI system we are, we are working to develop, perhaps you might say you have a very simple decision tree system or rule-based systems and then you go in a much more complex deep learning systems or multimodal deep learning systems and so on. Um, and then if you add a component of complexity with regards to data, you know, trillions of data points of different resolutions, different qualities, different models and so on. So I guess the complex at that point goes up exponentially. Now at that point when you have an AI system make, making a decision and then you want to understand whether it, it gives you trust, I think that is the point where you have to, to do a very comprehensive benchmarking, stress testing, you know, validate, evaluating in different uh, conditions, different circumstances so that you can at least approximate or simulate what the situation would be in a real case. So when you are deploying a system, let's say in, in a healthcare setting or a nuclear reactor setting, uh, making a decision in new data, so data that perhaps are not exactly uh, part of the distribution of the training set that you use to develop the model, then at that point you have to see how it behaves. So from my perspective, I think that is the point where you might have the human more in the loop to understand, or multiple humans in the loop to understand at uh, that real life deployment, how does a model behave? Because it could be that you have to stress test in different contexts, in different situations, at different moments of time. So it's not that you develop a system, you deploy it, it gives you good performance, it explains everything, and that is the end of, of the journey. I always think that the, the human component will always be there, perhaps at different stages of the pipeline, to be able to create the model and, and make sure that the model keeps performing at the level where uh, it was initially, because we have new data and new information coming in. So that's my, my take on it. Great. I, I think it's, it's, it's worth pointing out that the humans in the loop are, are out of the loop aren't necessarily the ideal situation, but it does reflect what you see in the real world. Like the, the fact that the pipelines will increasingly remove humans is something we have to deal with and anticipate with technological solutions in the future and getting decisions and the agency of the system to bring decisions where they need to go is, is really the next step. And, and that's based on, on you know, what a system may know about its own model space at where to take that decision in, in real time. Um, because uh, otherwise, the, the people will get automated away by the end users. And, and we really need to anticipate a world where that's happening so that we can make the technology that's needed to have, have trust, not, not philosophic trust, but quantifiable trust for the systems. I think that's actually a good transition to a question I want to pose to you. And it's uh, the most upvoted uh, question in the, uh, 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 in the the list here. So it's about the relationship between uh, explainability and accountability. Um, just because a system can be explained doesn't mean it allows for recourse to injustice, uh, recourse for injustices. Uh, so how can accountability and an explainability uh, be linked or tied together? Yeah, this is so important because the recourse falls victim to the black box just as much as the explainability does. And, and if we create a world where people can ever point to a black box and say, the machine told me so, then, then we take away you know, the recourse, we take away the understanding, we take away the empowerment of the individuals, um, we become automated by the systems. That's the absolute worst case scenario. Um, in the medical situation, right, the, the value of the medical practitioners is the experience that they bring. And, and we want every interaction to be informing them as much as it is the machines. We're looking at this in a very one-sided way where all the data is being funneled towards the machines so the models can improve. I mean, what about the people in the system? If they're not learning on a continuous basis, then you know, the systems are gonna break down from, from another part inside of the organization. Um, you know, we can't expect models to get better and better um, on their own you know, in silos and not use this, this amazing opportunity we have to make the organization itself better, the way that agents interact with one another, whether they are synthetic or whether they are human agents in those systems. Mm -hmm. I, I often hear people talking about super intelligence, like it's either going to save us or we should all be afraid it's gonna wake up one day and kill us and take our jobs. And it's not, that's superstitious. But superintelligence does exist today. It exists in a totally different form than you expected. It exists when agents get together and, and they work 
on behalf of common objectives. They, up, they update the objectives based on changes in the world, and they use resources based on those objectives. Right? This is organizations of people, and, and the ones that do that really well, some parts of some governments, corporations that, that are really well run and, and have very clear values and mission, they drastically outperform their peer group. And, and if we think about it in that context, we need to point the power of these systems to help the organization, not just any one silo. And that, that means machines learn, and it's not just for machines, people learn. Let's empower them all. That's great, thanks, thanks Brian. Um, the, the next question I'm gonna pose to you, Shane, and it's a, it, about coming back to this question of the high stakes. And um, one of our questions is, is looking at the difference, and you touched, uh, several of you touched on it earlier, the difference between a high stakes context like healthcare um, and a decision that has high stakes consequences for an individual. Um, because you might have, of course, a decision that's actually a very a high uh, stakes consequence for an individual, but in a sector or area that we don't think of intuitively as high stakes. Uh, and the reverse can be true. We can be in a healthcare setting and the decision might nevertheless be uh, relatively benign or inconsequential in terms of the things in health that we care most to protect. So um, in your view, uh, how do we balance these two different uh, kinds of high stakes? Um, uh, you know, low risk AI systems having harmful consequences like racism uh, and discrimination, even in uh, an area uh, that we don't think of as high stakes? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. I guess from the, the high stake healthcare context, even within that, there are kind of low stakes and high stakes uh, within reason or uh, different degrees of severity. So to give an example on that, if you were to develop a model to predict uh, 12 month mortality, the kind of the end goal of that would be to uh, anticipatory care planning to allow for that. Um, so while that is something you want to get right, that is kind of less consequential than if you were doing a, a cancer diagnosis model. So that's the kind of the, the two key differences there. And um, my opinion on that is that that will influence how we actually use these in clinical setting. So say the, the first case, that might be something that would be quicker to go live. Um, but the, the second example, that's where it might augment existing practices. So what you could have is you could have an AI that's running in the background. The, the MDTs function as normal. Um, the 100 patients who are on the service, uh, they receive their usual care. But then at the end of that process, the AI has ran and said, OK, why don't you look at these five extra people? I think these are high risk. So that's where we can, we can start to use it um, with the accountability still being on the clinicians. Great. So the, that actually, I think, um, brings us back again full circle to the, the kind of technical challenge of understanding what an explainable model is and what features define an explainable model. So uh, one of the other questions that uh, uh, people uh, seem uh, really eager to hear uh, your thoughts on is this question of what are some of the characteristics that define an AI model as explainable? So imagine, for example, you're a business and you're thinking about deploying AI in a particular context where you think you might need explainability. Um, how do you know or what questions do you ask to assess whether uh, the model that's being proposed will, will be explainable in the way that you need it to be? Well, I, can, I can start with that. Just to sure, kind of anyone who from, wants to jump in on uh, it. From the last point, um, a word we kind of hear a lot from collaborating with clinicians is bioplausible. Um, so a lot of the features we develop are very heavily clinician driven. So a lot of them would be uh, based off standard um, future engineering techniques, but the rest then are, are domain driven. So that means that when we then apply explainability techniques, uh, be it using a glass box method or using like a third party package on top of a black box like SHAP or Lime, um, the clinicians see these bioplausible features coming out of it. And to them, that makes sense, or in other cases, it doesn't make sense. So it's that kind of feedback which says, okay, this, from a clinical point of view or a domain point of view, this feature doesn't seem to make sense and it lets us interrogate it a bit more. I think it's important, important to point out that the things that make something truly understandable are probably simplicity and rigidity. <laughs> and the things that make machine learning powerful are probably complexity and flexibility. Um, but it's, it's, not, it's not just a case of finding the right balance. It's very clear that there's a strange distribution towards complexity 
um, you know, orders of magnitude more complexity that are probably necessary in most applications. It's extremely valuable in a lot of cases, and you don't want to say, well, you just can't use these tools, but especially in the learning process. You know, they, they, they abbreviate the time scale sometimes between unfathomable and, and un, unattainable to, to realistic and useful. Um, but we shouldn't start with the maximum level of complexity when, I don't know, maybe 80% of applications in the world could probably use much simpler methods that are much more interpretable and, and, and explainable and, and, and fundamentally you know, more practical for those applications as well. That's great. I, um, there's a, a, I think we have time for at least one more question, and there's one here that brings us back to the human in the loop. So uh, is removing or addressing the high stakes nature of a problem by bringing in a human uh, to make a decision, uh, is, is that not just avoiding the fact that we can't explain an AI system? Um, and maybe another way of thinking about this is, how do we avoid the scenario where the human in the loop uh, is essentially just uh, another machine sort of rubber stamping uh, an, an unexplainable verdict and then giving the illusion uh, that there has been something added to the decision, right, that makes it trustworthy. That is 100% how it's being used today. It is being used as a, a fix-all for the problem of not being able to understand what's in the black box. And it's not sustainable. And, and, and when it actually is manifest in the real world, it's quickly undone by other mechanisms. So it's a myth. But Shane, it sounds like you have seen it used where the, at least the clinical expertise is adding something, yeah. right? So it is possible for the human in the loop to be meaningful. Yeah, I, I suppose I'm coming at it from a, a different point of view where it's, it's quite new to use AI in live healthcare setting. So I guess we're using it cautiously. And the idea is that um, at this point in time, regular patient care shouldn't be affected. But it's, um, that, is the, that is the big risk. So if you fast forward six months or a year, um, you're always going to be conscious of that, that um, people get quite trusting of these systems, um, which we, we hope we get to the point where we can. But uh, the fear is that happening too early and the over-reliance on that until, until the technology is mature enough. Yeah. Is there a way to allow humans, to in, the human who is in the loop, to interrogate the, the system in some way? So an explanation comes from the machine, right? But what about the ability to interrogate the system and learn more about the, uh, you know, for the confidence uh, or level of uh, uncertainty that might be present? Or are there other ways that we can design systems uh, to be um, uh, perhaps more subject to examination by the humans in the loop so that they aren't just faced with a choice of rubber stamp or just disregard the machine and put in which case there's no point in having it? There are ways, and they have to, right? The, that, that explainability has to extend to the people that use the system. And then, and then again, as, as was mentioned before, the, the people whose lives are affected by them, so they have recourse. They're, they're, they're uh, another you know, key stakeholder in that, in that interaction. I think the way that we overcome it as an industry is partly through the technology that's used partly through new science that's being done today, but, but largely also in the way that the systems are designed and that, that a systemic approach of how it's integrated into an organization is more holistic and understanding of, of, of what things mean and what the implications are. Whereas today, uh, in, in, in you know, simple models, mm -hmm. a lot of that context of what's going on is lost. And, and the humans in those organizations have a lot of prior knowledge and expertise that could, that could shed a light on what the models are doing if, if that understanding and explanation is, is a part of how they're using it as a tool. And I think that's as the case that you described in medicine, the practitioners getting the context of the answer that hopefully can create a world where they're being empowered by the answers, not just something's being routed around them because of an answer being automated. So we've only got about a minute, but I'd love to hear from Dimitra uh, or uh, Georgios about are there reasons for optimism that we can make advances in this area to address some of these challenges, and, and what might those reasons be? Or um, I wanted to add something. Yeah, uh, please. If I will have time. So I think there is a risk there with having a human in the loop, especially if the system is not 
ready yet because there might be all the issues that uh, Shane mentioned uh, in the beginning about confounding variables and biases, etc. If someone sees the output and makes their, even if it's a human that makes a decision, they might be influenced by what they see. Um, but yeah, I'm optimistic. Of course, I, I love AI. Um, and I think that we can solve many complex problems uh, even by using deep learning. Uh, at the moment, it is black box, but I'm confident that this is going to change. Of course, we need more research, more resources, and so on. Um, but I'm positive, like with all other areas, like the medicine and uh, traveling to the moon and all this stuff, uh, we've managed to make progress as humanity. I'm sure we're going to make with AI. Just to finish with a positive remark, as well from my perspective, so that doesn't appear that everything is, uh, you know, is gloom and and and, and bad. just be aware, session time is running out, so ten real seconds. Quick. Ten seconds. Yeah, yeah. really. It, just I want to highlight that there is a huge amount of research happening on the extensibility side of deep learning systems. So it's not that no one is, is working on that, yeah. and they are working at different levels of this pipeline, so that you provide some visual explanations, some, some more attention-based explanation to all the models. So I think that there's a huge area where we are working on at the moment to make them more extensible. Fantastic. That's a great note to end on. Uh, can we have a hand of applause for our panelists? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Shannon, for that uh, brain tingling discussion there. Loads of uh, food for thought. Very thoughtful indeed. Um, thanks very much, panelists. Now is that time where people can move around, do the room shuffle, there's stuff going on next door. There's stuff going on upstairs. They're uh, inside the room. Um, welcome, guys. Thank you very much. <laughs> and round of applause again.